Uh, my name is Greg Judy. Uh, we ranch in central Missouri, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about using livestock to heal the land. And with our grazing practices in Missouri, uh, we, we run 16 farms. We lease 12 of them, and we own four of them. And we rotate livestock around our landscapes. And so we're focusing on feeding the soil, feeding the animals, and building healthy soil, healthy food for our local communities. And so that's the, what the gist that we're going to be talking about today, is using animals to heal the land. Okay, it's an honor to be here in front of you all this morning. You know, we, uh, we farm and ranch in uh, central Missouri. It's about halfway between Kansas City and St. Louis. Uh, we're right on the edge of the Ozarks. Um, we're not in farmland. We're in grazing land. It's the rolling hills. And so that's what's kind of given us our competitive, our competitive advantage is we're not competing with uh, row crop farmers. So we're on land that is not suitable to put a plow into. And so we can take some pretty poor land and uh, we can do some pretty neat things with it. And today that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about is using livestock to build healthy soil and profit. Folks, if you can't, it all starts in the soil. And, you know, for many years I called myself a grass farmer. You know, that's what I was. And you'll hear me mention today a little bit about Ian Mitchell Ennis. Uh, he's a South African high-density grazer that actually turned me around. And the first time I heard Ian talk, he didn't call himself a grass farmer. He called himself a microbe farmer. And so he took it another level down. He's looking at the soil, and that's what it's all about, folks. We've got to take care of our soils, and I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir here a little bit, but it's just extremely important. You just can't have bare soil. And I even take it one step further. I don't get comfortable seeing bare soil. If my animals make a boo-boo and, you know, we're out there in a rainstorm or something and we create a bare spot on our farms or ranch, I don't, I just don't turn a blind eye to that. I fix it immediately. You know, cover that soil up. I look at the soil as nature's skin. And if we, we remove nature's skin, she's going to pay us back. And in our area, she's going to pay us back with weeds. We're going to get weeds. She's going to put a weed there to heal that soil. She's not going to leave it bare. And so, you know, we've got to keep an eye on that. Um, that's what we're focused on, folks, is, you know, we're basically trying to uh, convert land that we've got some pretty mediocre land. I mean, we're talking about topsoil uh, one to two inches. You know, it's, it's not very thick. But I tell you what, it's amazing what land can do when you start doing the correct things to it. And it doesn't take very long for it to start working in sync. And there's a nature, you know, in nature, if you look at trying to manage with her instead of beating her up all the time, you start getting along a lot better. And that, I used to wake up in the morning, every morning, and my focus was, what can I kill today? That's what it did. You know, there, everything was trying to put me out of business. And when I started looking at, there's things out there, why are they there? Just like the invasive species, you know, we've got some of those on our farms, like the autumn olive bush, and everybody's freaking out about it. It's taking over the whole Midwest, and I'm like, that was me. I was in that boat. Now we've, <clears throat> we've adopted a different attitude. We're going to learn how to make money with autumn olive, and I'm going to talk a bit about some of that changes we've done. So basically what we've got, folks, we've got this herd out here, and we, we're, we're trying to be uh, more translucent of what we're doing with them. We're moving them around these landscapes, and we're basically doing a predator-prey relationship. So we don't have the, the mountain lions, we don't have the grizzly bears, we don't have the pack of wolves anymore, but you know what? We do have that. And without electric fence, folks, we just couldn't do what we're doing. Um, we've got 16 farms today. Every single one of them is... is high tensile wire. Uh, we don't have any barbed wire, woven wire. Uh, you know, when you lease land, it's got to be economical to fence. And you can't go out here and spend, you know, fifty to $100,000 putting up a perimeter fence of barbed wire with steel post every 8 to 12 foot. When you can take this stuff and put a post every 30 or 40 feet with one wire, because folks, once your cattle get trained to hot wire, it doesn't take much to keep them in. It really doesn't. Uh, it's more, you know, it's, there's more animal weight in pounds per acre below the soil than there is in soil in healthy pastures than there is above it. And that's something that I really focus on. I used to drive across my pastures. 
in my pickup truck. I didn't think about it. Finally, one day I went out there, you know, I, I'm like, wait a minute, there's critters down there eating, and they've got a good salad bar, they're working in my soil, they're building humus, and I just drove across their dinner plate, and I compacted that soil. We don't drive on our pastures anymore, only with ATVs. It's got to be frozen, and then, of course, we can bring a, a heavier implement out. But when it's not frozen, boy, we just, we just stay off of it. Um, again, this is some of the lease land. This would be a brand new lease. Um, we've had that one now for two years. It doesn't look like much right now at that time that picture was taken. But you know what? I would have burned that. That's what I used to do. When I'd get a lease farm that had a bunch of thatch on it, like that, I'd throw a match to it. Burn it. Get rid of it. And then I'd go in behind that when I burned it and I'd throw some seed down on it. Well, folks, there's a ton of carbon there that's been accumulated over 50 years. We're in the life-giving business. We don't want to kill stuff. And so by using the animals to trample that thatch onto the ground, I got this huge explosion of grass and earthworms and centipedes and just all kinds of soil life. Remember this, burning promotes plant spacing. The plants get further apart. If you continually burn a pasture every year, the plants will get further apart. Grazing promotes plant density. It brings the plants closer together. Use that animal hoof. It is a great tool. You just got to learn how to use it. So that's my soil building recipe. I had a mob of ruminant animals. I start tramping the carbon onto the soil surface. And here's the big one. You've got to give it a recovery period. Folks, it is a grass plant. And if you come back too soon, you're going to be out of business. You can't graze a plant that's not recovered. Well, you can, but you're not going to be doing as well. This is a field, this is on a lease farm. Uh, we ended up buying this farm, or uh, the cattle bought it. I started adopting a little bit about, um, how many of y'all have heard of Gordon, Gordon Hazard? Yeah, Gordon Hazard, he just passed away, I think it was last year. He was 90 years old, great old Mississippi rancher. And somebody asked Gordon, he said, well, you know, how much did you charge those cows for that land out there? And he had 1,800 steers. And he was moving them across his ranch. And Gordon had about, I don't know, 3,000 acres he'd bought over time. He said, what's your land use charge on them steers? And Gordon looked at the guy and he said, well, I don't charge them steers nothing for that land. They bought it. I didn't. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. You know, that was, that's just the way Gordon thought, you know. And so we'd, I've got, we've got an account. So every time we sell any livestock, we have a land account. And a little bit goes into that. And when the animals can afford another farm, we'll buy it. We don't go into debt. Not saying you don't have to go in debt starting out. You may have to do some of that. But folks, the thing that's turned us around is the lease land. I read an article back in 1997, 98, somewhere in that time period. And the title of that article, basically the gist of it was, there was one quote there that changed my entire life. And it said, your sole purpose in life should not be to own the land, but to control it. And boy, I tell you, that turned a light bulb in my world. And we started looking around the neighborhood, and there was a lot of land laying around that people weren't doing anything with. And so I say for young people starting out today, if you can get your hands on some lease land, it preserves your equity. Use your equity to buy livestock. Later on, you can buy the land. But starting out, it's pretty tough. I did that. And I almost lost our farm. And I had a job in town, too. So getting the land leased allows you to get your numbers up. You know, we're up to, we range somewhere between three to 400 head of animals. That's just cows. We've got sheep, we've got pigs, we've got chickens and other things. You can't get your numbers up if you're in debt right off the start. There's, there's no money left. And that interest payment just kills you. Absolutely. I've been there. Um, I think we need to get animals back on the land. We, you know, Temple talked about that yesterday a little bit. And when I grew up where I, was, where I am right now as a little kid, I can remember moving into that area. I was born in northern Minnesota on a dairy farm up by Duluth. And it didn't take too many years. My mom got tired of the cold winter and said, we got to move out of here. So we went to Missouri, been there ever since. But 
One of the things I think, when we moved into that area, every single crop field around us had fence on it. And in the corner of the crop field was a little pond. Everybody grazed their crop residues. Everybody. And now those fences are gone. The ponds have been pushed in. And the soil's turned a different color. It's not black anymore. I think we need to clone uh, Jay Fuhr and put him in every single NRCS office in the United States. What do y'all think? I mean, I've heard more success, more success stories from farmers and ranchers around here due to what this group here has started. It's kudos to y'all. Y'all do great work here. Fantastic. You know what's amazing to me is your all's growing season so short, and yet you're still just knocking it out of the park. I think that's awesome. So we're focusing on the soil food smorgasbord. Now, some folks that look at that, folks, this is a picture of the pasture that got away from us. So in the springtime, people ask me, how fast do you move your animals? Well, it depends. If you're getting a lot of moisture and the plants are growing quickly, we tend to move our animals across our farm faster. You get into June and July and it gets hot and we haven't had a rain for eight weeks and the plants have slowed down, well, then we slow our animal movements down. Because if you don't, you're going to get around your farm too quickly. And you're going to be back too soon, and then you're grazing plants that aren't recovered. So here's a pasture that would have got away from us. What I mean by that is in the springtime, we start out grazing, and we're just taking the top third of the plant. We got three-fourths across our farms, and everything sent up seed heads. And so we just stopped grazing forward, stopped. And we act like we didn't own 25% of our farm. We went back to where we started in the spring because it was ready to graze again already. And we started grazing again. Animal performance through the roof because the animals are grazing very palatable, high energy plants. We let all this stuff go. But now we're coming back. This is the end of July, August. We haven't had any rain. Look at the mass out there. And those animals absolutely did a number. I'll just get some more pictures of what happened there. We make sure we don't graze the roots. Folks, if you're grazing your pastures down, I don't care what time of season it is, even in the wintertime, if you're taking it down where you can putt on it with a golf ball, you're taking your pastures down too short. Residue, it's all about residue. Stock and density versus stock and rate. Um, you know, stock and density is the number of animals that are on a paddock for a certain time, and stock and rate is the number of animals that are on your farm for a calendar year. So don't get those two confused. There's that same pasture, <clears throat> so we would have put up a polywire, and uh, we're getting rid well, the cows have been brought in there, and we left them in there for 12 hours at 100,000 pounds stock and density per acre, and that's what they did. So they didn't trample 100% of that on the ground, and I get a little bit upset when I see people say, well, you've got to nuke it. No, you don't need to nuke it. You've got to leave some of that standing. Why would you want to leave some of that forage standing? Catch the wind. I heard somebody say it. Great. Slow the wind down. There's also critters living in those clumps. You don't want to nuke it all down. But look what that young man's holding up in his hands there. That's my litter. That's my armor. And then four weeks later, it looked like that. So we've got a lot of legumes coming up through that Kentucky 31 fescue. And we've got a really nice armor on the soil. There's no bare soil there. But it's just amazing what's coming up. If you pull that back, you still got that nice armor of layer of compost there, but the earthworms are turning a lot of that into soil. There it is. That's black gold, folks. That's better than gold. You can't eat gold. Look at that. That's an earthworm turd. That's a big one. He must have worked on that all night, okay? Ian's a big guy. Ian's from Africa. He took that picture. He laid down on his belly. Ian, go about 320. He's laying on his belly. I'm like, what are you doing? He said, I got to get a picture of this turd. And uh, that was a big one. But folks, seriously, on earthworm castings, uh, Jay, Jay's got a great experiment going out at Minokin Farms. He, was, he brought me out there, and I was in heaven because he had worms. Man, he's got worms out there like you wouldn't believe. I don't know how many tubs. How many tubs of worms you got out there, Jay? 30? And uh, he's collecting worm juice. Yeah, it's a pretty neat experiment he's doing. Strip, strip grazing winter stockpile. Um, I think winter stockpile, especially in the Midwest where we're at, it's, it's a huge cost savings. I mean, when you can graze in the wintertime when everybody else is feeding hay, it's because they don't have any grass. And I, get, I get this all the time. People will come by and they'll see me out there moving a wire and they've got a hay bale on the back of their truck. And like, well, Greg, it may work on your place, but it'll never work over here. 
I'm like, well, you know, it's that darn fence line. That's what's keeping them from doing it. And he said, well, I don't want to take the time to move that wire. <laughs> I'm like, what? Time you start your tractor up and it gets warmed up, I've already moved those animals. I'm back to the house. It doesn't take any time to move animals once they get broke. There's another close-up picture of winter stock pile grazing. The beautiful thing about fescue in the Midwest is it does stay green, partially green all winter long. Now, a lot of people are cursing Kentucky 31 infected fescue. That's what that is. But folks, if you'll learn to keep diversity in fescue, other plants besides that, and don't graze it down to the dirt, they're finding out now that Kentucky 31, the toxin level's the highest in that first inch and a half to two inches above ground. So don't graze it that short. If you graze it down to the ground, fescue's gonna, you're gonna have some impact on your animals. So it's Again, it comes back to management. I figured you North Dakotans would love that picture I'm grazing through snow. All right, don't make, you can make fun of my snow, but I've got a little snow there. Man, I walked out of the hotel room this morning. I couldn't believe it. It made me really appreciate Missouri weather. <laughs> the wind was blowing this morning. Man, it was, y'all are tough people, okay? I guess the untough ones have already been weeded out. Y'all are all very tough. Um, but the reason I was showing that picture is that's the advantage of keeping a longer stockpile in the wintertime where you, we have some sun and we'll get some warm periods through the winter. If you have forage sticking up through the snow, it will melt the snow away from that area if you can get temperatures above 30, 32 degrees. And that's what we found out. Uh, once that forage is grazed off, and it's shorter, and then you get a snow over it, it won't melt off anymore. That forage actually heats up the snow around those clumps. Um, this is broken soil, and that is a former crop field that was nuked and nuked and nuked with herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and it was soybean, 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 soybean every single year. I don't think I ever saw the farmer plant anything but soybeans. And I remember when I leased that farm, I went into that field that fall, and it was it was. It was ugly. It was ugly. There wasn't any residue. There was washes all through it because there wasn't anything to stop the rain. The rain was not soaking in. You could take a spade and go down that deep and it was dry under the soil. So it was capping over. No earthworms. And the ground was covered with cockleburs. <laughs> Cocklebur seeds. So the guy had a bunch of birds that had gotten resistance to whatever he was spraying them with. And so that was what I grew the first year. And I'm like, okay, I've got this mob grazing thing going on. I'll just graze those cockleburs off. I did. Those cattle ate every single bur in that field. And I'm like, man, I've whipped these burrs. Guess what happened? More. They came back worse. You know what I did? I pushed those cattle so hard that they ate the, the palatable plants. There was orchard grass and clover some fescue, Timothy, down underneath that. They ate that first. And they ate it down to the ground. Then they ate the cockleburs. And then I started noticing cows limping about two weeks later. I pushed them so hard that I compromised animal performance. You'll hear me talk about animal performance today. The way I whipped that field, folks, is I acted like I didn't own it. And I have to thank Ian for that. Because Ian was there in the fall, and he goes, Greg, when are you going to get tired of grazing cockleburs? This is the second year. I'm like, well, I was kind of tired of it the first year. And he said, then quit grazing it like you're grazing it. He said, what's the most vulnerable time of a weed? When is that? It's when it comes up in the spring. He's a little bitty guy. Well, cockleburs come up about in Missouri about May 30th. Well, I was going in the first of May and grazing that field off the orchard grass and the clovers and things. And when I grazed it off, well, now I gave sunlight to all these little seedlings. And they all came up and expressed themselves. And they got eight feet tall and stalks on them about that big around. Of course, I didn't own a brush hog or a tractor, and so I was the laughing stock of the neighborhood. So the next year, I didn't graze that field in the spring. I went around it, and I whipped it. I whipped it in one year. Those little birds came up in June, but I had forage that tall over the baby birds. And they never could express themselves. And we've never had a problem with that field since. And so I say this, as long as you've got weeds and you focus on those weeds, you're going to have weeds. 
You got to focus on what you want and just graze the tips of the plants that you want. Don't graze those good plants down too short. Let them put out their wings and put pressure on those other plants. That's how you whip weeds. That's my soil life builder. That is a baling order that I built from scratch. And we pull it behind a, you can pull it behind a pickup truck. We use our ATV mostly like that. And uh, all the bales are pre-placed. And so we'll have our bales out across our farms in the wintertime in different paddocks. We don't put them all in one spot. And I do not use bale rings. I will, I will not use bale rings. If I lived up here, I would be doing bale grazing. I can't do bale grazing in Missouri. I tried it. We're too puggy. We get too many thaws, and the ground gets just soupy. And if you've got a bunch of cows around a bale, they just destroy the sod, absolutely destroy it. But by unrolling it, I've got some pictures of what we've done. It's pretty neat what happens. And we get some snow. It gets deep enough that I can't even unroll. We'll make a wind roll. I've got a little V plow that I pull behind the truck, and then we unroll the hay. We bring the livestock in. It looks like that when we're done. And so we're spreading a lot of carbon across our farm and the manure and the urine. And then we get a snowstorm. That's our driveway down to our house. That was just about three weeks ago. And it got deep enough that we couldn't unroll hay again. So what I did is I just took the, the blade on my tractor because I am so adamant about getting those bales back out on the land. Folks, we don't bale any hay. We don't own any baling equipment. We buy our hay. And we unrolled in between every one of those rows. And I'm telling you what, that's going to grow some grass. That's going to grow some grass. And by moving across our landscape all winter long, the cattle are on clean ground all the time. We don't worm. We've never wormed. I've never put any wormer on any of our animals. If you don't make animals stay on dirty ground where they're exposed to the manure, or if you don't make them graze the plants down too short, you're not going to have a heavy worm load. There's a picture of it. Some of the cows out cleaning up the hay from a distance. The neighbors saw that and they just thought we were nuts. Like, what's he doing out there in all those wind rows? Well, next year you'll be able to see right where that snow was packed and where it wasn't. The grass will be taller in those wind rows for sure. So we get done at a farm. We got snow on. We can't haul those cattle. We've got 16 farms, and they're all spread out in five miles, but they're all in a five-mile circle. And so well, this particular drive here, I think we were walking about 300 head, and we do it at 10 o'clock in the morning because I am a full-time rancher now. Everybody goes to work. We put them on the highway occasionally. I don't like using the highway very much, but this was a necessity. We were in a snowstorm. There was another storm coming right behind this one, and we walked those cows and cat, everything down the road. And there they are going to the new farm. So we've got some stockpile on this farm, and we're going to start. We had to feed hay there a little while. And we do the same thing with our sheep. Now, on the sheep, we don't feed them anything. Sheep don't get any hay. A sheep has a foot that can dig like a deer, okay? And... So what I did is I went, there's about 24 inches of snow out there. I just took my tractor and I made wind rows all over that field like that. And those sheep went down and got that forage. I mean, they are so aggressive. And we've, we've got a lot of timber on our farms. Those sheep will go down in the woods and they'll eat oak leaves and do just fine. Um, it's just amazing how, how tough sheep are. For people just starting out, you can run a whole bunch more sheep on the same amount of ground than you can cattle. And the return, I'll give you a real quick primer on sheep. You can take a ewe lamb that's seven months old. She was born in May, bring her around to December 1st, and you can put a ram into her. Not all of them will breed that first year, but some of them will, about 60%. Those ewe lambs will give you a baby when they turn a year old. You can't do that with cattle. So you have a lot quicker turnaround if you're starting up and you're trying to generate some profits to keep you on the land. Sheep, I would definitely look at. We get ice. <clears throat> this followed the snowstorm. So we just, didn't, we just barely got the snow part of it melted and this hit us. We were without power for three days. Um, the roads were impassable. You couldn't get to the cattle. And the cattle were three miles from our house. You couldn't get to it on a vehicle. So we, thank goodness, we have the ATVs. And when our, the hay was there, we were able to get over this ATV and unroll hay to 300 head of cattle. There they are. 
Now we're strip grazing again. We're back grazing. Today we're grazing at home. But when you have stuff like this, the ice, folks, when cattle try and bite that off, it just falls on the ground. They can't get their mouth around. They can't get the tongue around it. But you get one or two days of sun on that, and it's good. So, you know, people say you don't, don't feed any hay in the winter. I think hay is a good insurance policy. You need to have some, especially up here. Um, but if you don't have any and you need it, you're in trouble. We call these our solar-powered soil builders. Again, they're on stockpile. That's winter stockpile. And I just love it when my cows can feed themselves. And I don't have to. So here we are in an open savanna. This has been an area where we went in and cut some trees out. The trees are so thick that there wasn't nothing growing in there but leaves. Just dry leaves coming off the trees. Once we took and opened up that canopy... And we would feed hay, and in the wintertime, we unrolled hay in those trees. This is what came up. Now, folks, we don't put any seed down. And Ian, he's always nailing me about seed. He's like, Greg, there's never been a seeding done as efficiently as what Mother Nature has in your seed bank. I mean, from the time the earth was created, there's been seed being dropped. The problem is we don't graze correctly to let it express itself. So we need to... Figure that one out. That's a, that's a pretty cool picture there. This is uh, the pigs in the timber. And so the pigs went through there. We raised pasture or woods pigs. We don't put them in the pasture. They're always in timber. But we're moving them. We don't let them nuke our woods. The pigs are moved about every two to three days. We give them large areas. What we have found out about pigs in woods, don't let them get bored. If a pig gets bored, he's going to root. And you'll be able to bury a Volkswagen in it. I mean, a big hog, they can really tear up your land. But if they flip the logs, we feed our pigs once a day in the morning. And the rest of the day, they have to go out and work for a living. We don't have welfare hogs. In other words, we're not going to put a feeder out there. They can just lay around the feeder and eat. And I think that's why our meat's so good. I mean, this pastured pork that we're selling is unbelievable. It has flavor. It has taste. And I tell people... You know, I do a, quite a few videos. I've got a YouTube channel. And I've got one video on there of our pigs eating hickory nuts. Folks, that feeder that we fed the grain in was setting full. They left that when I put the hickory nuts in there. They left their pig feed and came to the nuts. So pigs know what's best. And so do cattle. So this would have been an area that the pigs went in. And then we did put down a cover crop in there. That's a nine-way species. And it just exploded up. And then we brought the cattle in behind that. So there's an area that we weren't getting any production out of as far as forage. It was just too shaded. The pigs kind of busted it up, and uh, we seeded it. This is the farm that we used to lease. We ended up buying this one as well. Uh, that was somebody, I don't know, I never did understand that paddock, but we did hit it fairly hard that winter, and that's what came up in the spring. But why didn't it come up in the other paddock? Because that, that is the paddock division right there. But it's just amazing. Somewhere in the history, there was a, somebody put a lot of clover in there. And we never saw any clover until we started grazing it correctly. By the way, folks, that's too much clover. You can kill cattle grazing that. So make sure if you're going to graze something that looks like that, that the clover is a little bit over mature maybe, or later in the morning when all the dew's off of it, you don't want to graze wet clover with a bunch of cattle. You can, that much, you can get in trouble. Uh, we talk a little bit about bruising the soil. We want the animals to move across our landscape, and they have that cloven hoof. And see, there's billions and billions of microbes living on the root hairs of those plants. And when the animals walk across the landscape and step on that, it wakes them up. And they all start sourcing food. Maybe the predators start going after other little guys and eating them. There was a great video, and I think it's still available online. It was by Dr. Pat Richardson. Have you all heard of Dr. Pat Richardson? She's a professor, I believe it was at Texas, uh, well, the Longhorns. <laughs> I believe she went there. It might have been Texas Tech. I don't remember. But she put a video out. She went out into a very diverse pasture that was being mob grazed. Good rotation, a lot of soil life. And she dug up a shovel full of that. And then she put it in a bucket and screened it out with some kind of filter. And she blew it up on a 60X micro, micron microscope. It looked like Jurassic Park. There was a Tyrannosaurus chasing a, 
a worm that long. This worm had looked like 60 legs on each side. And he's chasing him. And he's got this big old spike on the end of his nose. And he, kept, he jumps on it. And he drives the spike into it. And you can see the fluid of that worm coming into his body. And then his eyes light up. And he's got these great big yellow antennas on his head. When I saw her video, that's when I stopped driving on my pastures. Because Pat said, Greg, if you sit down to a nice T-bone steak and you got a baked potato there and maybe some dressing and you're getting ready to eat and somebody takes a tractor and just busts across your tabletop with a disc on it, are you going to be a happy chap? Nope. So quit driving on your microbes. Don't be doing that. Pat would get mad if she saw you step on a spider. It was all about soil life. It's all about soil life. Do cattle destroy riparian areas? Yes. If they're left there, they will do that. If they're not, they do that. This is a farm we leased. We've had it since 2001, 250 acres, and it was continuously grazed, and it was a wreck. That was solid dirt all the way down to that little creek, and at that time, there was no water in that creek because when it rained, it just flushed that whole farm down to the neighbor. Now we've got catchment. We're catching the rainwater. That creek is flowing now, and you don't want to step off in it. It's deep. It's waist deep. There's frogs in there. There's fish living in there. There's coons. There's all kinds of stuff along that riparian zone now. But we grazed it differently. We put animals on that for a short period, short duration, and then we moved them. We didn't leave them there. So I think cattle can really heal riparian zones if it's done correctly. But look, look at the diversity in that picture. I mean, there's everything in there, even my hated cocklebur. There's a few of them in there. You know, it's just, it's, it's another plant, okay? But there's all kinds of stuff in there. And my neighbor... He's still grazing the other way. I'm catching his soil. It comes down my creek. His soil covers up my grass. It lays it over, and then my grass grows back up through his soil and plants it. That's how my, my creek banks are uppening. They're uppening with his soil. He doesn't want it, so I'll take it. He just doesn't like his soil. That's not water source. If you're trying to raise livestock. I don't care. Sheep, cattle, pigs, whatever. Even chickens. Folks, cat, you know, livestock are 70, 75% water, and you're making them drink that? That's not good. There's water. Good, clean water. I have a rule of thumb that in a pinch, if I wouldn't drink it, I'm not going to force my animals to drink it. And there's actually been some studies done. If you provide your animals really high quality water, just in one growing season, that calf will weigh 50 pounds more. The calf that was on that cow, you'll get another 50 pounds of gain just by giving them good water. The lower the class of animal, in other words, a baby goat, they are so picky. They've got to have really high quality water or they're not going to do well. A cow, you can get by a little bit better with some brackish water, but be careful. This is a plant that we're starting to see come up on a lot of our farms. That's the eastern gamma grass. Uh, eastern gamma grass covered Missouri. Back in the day of the buffalo, settlers came in. They started clearing land and plowing it, and uh, that disappeared. Folks, we're starting to see this come up on that 250 acres, just clumps of it all over the place. Where's it coming from? I know the guy that owned that farm before I did, and he didn't have gamma grass. He didn't feed any gamma grass hay. Where's it coming from? I tend to think that's something that I've been laying in that seed bank a long time. How many of you all familiar with the seed head of gamma grass? It's got a seed armor on it that's equivalent to steel. It's got a real hard shell on it. And so it can last a long time in the soil. But when I started giving this forages in my pastures a longer recovery period, in other words, I'd beat it up a little bit with the hooves, then I'd get off of it and give it these full recovery periods in the summertime. That's when I started to see this and this, the big blue. I didn't plant that one either. So we're starting to see the native warm season grasses reappear on our farms. I'm excited. That's the grass that they talk about in Kansas that the, you know, the, the settlers would be riding on a horse. You've all probably read this. They'd be sitting in their stirrups or in their saddle and the grass was taller than their head. That's what they were talking about. Big blue stem. Because it'll get eight to nine feet tall. Now you don't want to graze it you don't want to let it get that tall in a grazing system. That's, that's a little bit, I mean, that's not too bad. They'll still eat that pretty good. The beautiful thing about uh, big blue stem 
is it doesn't have any toxins in it. It's very palatable. It's really good for wildlife. And it's got a deep tap root ball on it. Uh, this one here, Dan Shepard uh, used to carry the gamma grass seed. He dug down with a track hoe in his gamma grass field. And it was 18 feet. He went down 18 feet and found the end of that root. Now, if you get in a drought here and you've got plants that's got roots even eight feet long, 18 feet, are you kidding me? That's like a tree. So I'm kind of excited about these warm season grasses coming back. Um, we, we did some experiments with cover crops where we no-tilled a uh, cover crop right into our fescue. And that was done the end of July, which is probably a little bit late, but it rained every day through the month, through the days of July. It was so wet. This is three years ago. And that was at uh, two weeks. This is what it looked like eight weeks later. Uh, people said you can't drill that into Kentucky 31. You've got to spray it. In other words, you got to kill your Kentucky 31 first. I'm like, well, I don't know. I didn't spray that. And you look how tall the fescue was. I'm not a very good row cropper. Look at that. I, look at the skips. I'm a terrible, terrible on a drill. But that's how tall the fescue was. And it still came up and competed. That was eight weeks of no rain. That made a lot of good grazing. So, you know, if you do some of this cover crops and you can preserve some of your pasture, maybe for some fall grazing, I'd be looking at doing some of that. The dung beetle. We've got a lot of dung beetles now. Um, you know, back when I custom grazed, uh, we custom grazed for seven years. And I tell people, you, you do what you got to do to make a living. And it was really good money. Especially for somebody that didn't have any. And it got me out of debt. It paid off. We were actually able to build a savings account and bought our own herd debt-free with other people's money by grazing their cattle on other people's land. That's what No Risk Ranching book was written about. But back to what I had to do. I had to sleep with the devil. What I mean by that is I had to pour Ivamec on cattle. If I didn't Ivamec those cows when they came into our farm, I didn't get cattle. And the easiest time to do it was when they're coming out of the chute. So we'd Ivamec all the cattle... And I noticed my manure paths were not breaking down. They weren't breaking down. But I did it anyway. Today, you can't find a manure pad on our farms. Folks, this is a really instrumental tool. We need that guy. And that's why right there. I mean, that's a big hole. It's about the diameter of a nickel. And right now, you know, the dung beetles come into your manure paths and break those down. They're putting holes down that deep. Well, if you've got 10,000 holes around your farm, or let's say three or four holes underneath every manure pat, what happens when you get a rain? Darn right. You're soaking up water. It's not running onto your neighbors. Also, that dung beetle's rolling up a ball, and he's putting it down in the bottom of that hole, just like this. That's him. That's pretty nasty looking, isn't it? I mean, that's just gross. I used to look at these little guys, folks, every morning when I go do chores. I milked a cow for 12 years at home. I, I made the mistake of asking my dad if I could milk the cow when I was second grade. And I got a couple streams going in that bucket. He said, son, it's yours. <laughs> he walked away. But I remember going out to milk the cow in the morning, and those things were everywhere. This is before Ivamec was ever developed. They were everywhere. And we didn't have manure. We didn't have hardly any flies. Folks, the flies lay their larvae in that manure pat, and the flies hatch out, and they attack your cattle. There's a video, and it's, it's kind of cool. Th this guy here that's doing all the riding, and that's the male. He's the man. There's the female in the back pushing. She does all the work. And that male rides it, and his counterweight keeps that thing rolling. And they'll roll it clear to a hole, and it goes down in the hole. She'll dig a hole and place that in the bottom. And when the ba baby dung beetle hatches, that's what he eats. And that cycle started over again. Folks, the manure pat is the most valuable asset on your farm. If you're putting wormer down the back of your cattle, or you got back rubs out there or whatever, any kind of petroleum product you're pouring on the back of those cows, you're slowing up that breakdown of those manure pats. It's costing you money. We can't climb inside of a cow and look at the rumen to tell how good a job we're doing grazing, but we certainly can look at the manure pads. Folks, when I look at that manure pad, I get pretty excited. You know why? Because I can tell by looking at that that my cow is going to get bred. She's going to breed back. The calf is not going to get scours. The calf is putting on weight. Probably not going to see any fescue foot, no pneumonia. 
because that rumen is working perfectly. You like to see that little pond in the middle, and I like to see the stacking on the edges. And I don't want it very tall, maybe two inches max. If you've got them stacking up that tall, your cows are not performing very well. You're feeding them too much cellulose. The plants are over mature, and their gut is having a hard time breaking that down. If the manure is real runny, there's several things that could be going on with that. One is you may be getting too much protein in them. You're making them graze the plants down too short. Move that up where they're just grazing the top parts of your plant. Your stack, that thing will start stacking up on you. Or if it's real runny, she stays runny all the time. She's probably got parasites. Sell her. Don't worm your whole herd because you got one wormy one. The rest of them are building up some resistance, and you go in there and worm your whole herd. You've kicked the crutch out. Now you've got a crutch underneath all of them. You don't want to do that. This is how we put up our, our paddocks. Um, we use an ATV. We've actually got a better system than that. It's still ATV, but it's designed a little differently. Healthy soil is equal healthy animals. There's a lot of people that are starting to do and getting more interested in doing grass-finished beef. Folks, even the big boys want a piece of it. You've got Cargill. You've got uh, Tyson. They all want some of this grass-fed market, and that's because it is the highest profit margin there is right now in beef is the grass-fed because it's hard to do. It takes longer. And what we're finding out, a lot of people jumped in with 12, 1,400-pound cows, and they're trying to finish steers out here on their perennial pastures. It doesn't work so well. You've got too big of an animal. Just remember this. Learn to hate leg. <laughs> if you've got a leggy animal that you can read a newspaper underneath of, if you can open up a newspaper and shove it underneath its belly and read it without touching the ground, you've got too much leg on your cows. Folks, that space between the bottom of the belly and the ground sells for nothing. It's air. Learn to like gut. People come and they see our animals like, gosh, look at that dang thing. It's got a big old belly, Greg. I'm like, yeah, it needs a big old belly to store all the grass. We've bred the gut out of our animals, folks. We got to get the gut, okay? That's just a pretty good answer. That's kind of lopsided. It looks like he's got a little bitty head. That, that picture's funny. That one looks better on this side for some reason. Learn to look for this, the brisket. Folks, too many people are butchering their animals before they're finished. And it's giving grass-fed beef a bad name. Oh, you want lean beef? No, you don't. If it's lean and it doesn't have any grass fat on it, what you've got is a shoe sole. And when you grill it, it's like eating one. And people say, well, I tried that grass-fed, that, grass that is nasty. It was like chewing a piece of rubber. Well, yeah, it probably was. You've got to get some finish on these animals. You need to have the wrinkles in the neck. You need to have the brisket filled out. I think I've got another picture here of a, a better picture. That one's not finished. You know how I can tell? Right there. You look on the tail head of the animals. That tail head should be fat. You should have a minimum of three wrinkles on the tail head. Otherwise, that animal should not be processed. It's not ready. Now, there's some that's getting close. See the wrinkles? There's one, two, three. This was not ready. She, he doesn't have any fat on his tail head. There's one thing about that picture. If you don't, if you're just getting into livestock and you're going to pick out some seed stock, try and find animals that look like that. I don't care if they're black, yellow, purple, whatever, but make sure they're slick. They need to shed off their winter hair coats. The sooner they can get rid of that winter hair coat, they're performing better. If they don't shed their hair coat, that animal's not going to make you much money. It may not even breed back. I think we need to use unfair advantages. I mean, you can take a U like that. You know, that's a $160 hair sheep U, and she can give you three. I'd prefer she just gave me two because, you know, she, she'll do better. Three will pull her down a little bit, but they can raise three. But when you can take one and get two, that multiplication thing, it's hard to do that with cattle. Uh, we ran the rams. We always take the rams out and put them in with the pigs. This is when we had Tamworth. People said you couldn't lamb with the pigs. Well, we did. And people were concerned that that hog would eat that baby lamb. We found out that a hog couldn't catch a baby lamb. And also, if that hog steps one more foot closer to that lamb, guess what's going to happen? Yep, 
that ewe's going to bust that hog's butt. It's going to let out a big squeal. So there we are going to work in the morning. We've got the animals on the road, and that is my neighbor's soybean field. The fence is not hot. But once you get your animals trained, folks, uh, you don't have to make that fence hot. They're not, I've never had an animal go through that because they get used to moving. They know you're taking them to a better place, something that's going to be fresh and clean, and they're just happy to go. I mean, but one of the things I've learned on long cattle moves, and I'll share this with you, is get out of sight. What I mean by that is once you get them on the road, you get that foil and you get out of there. Because if they can see you, they're going to run. And when they run, they're going to leave Junior at the back of the cattle drive. You got baby calves, a whole bunch of them, getting piled up back there because the calves have taken off. They're just anxious to go. And they're trying to follow you. But if you get out of sight, they'll walk. And if you leave a bunch of baby calves at the very back of that cattle drive, what have you got? A wreck? <laughs> That's right. Um, they'll go back to where they saw mommy last, and that's back to the last farm. And you're not going to stop them. They're going to run through you. But we've learned the correct way to do that. Carbon, we've got to feed the soil. And good grazing management, trampling the carbon, we like to use the idea that every grass blade trample gives you two back. We've been ridiculed for that comment. I don't care. It's still the focus. I'm trying to give something back. Folks, I've got a landowner... He just passed away two years ago, and uh, he was 93 years old. And when I went on to his farm, bless his soul, that old guy would be out there waiting for me when I got off work at night. That's when I still worked in town. And um, Marshall would go, what are you going to do tonight? I said, I'm going to move cows, and I'm going to put in a paddock. And that old guy would walk along behind me, stepping in my post, putting the wire on, because he saw it working. 93 years old. When he passed, he was probably 85 at that time. But what always tickled me was Marshall would look at me when I got ready to leave his farm. He had 160 acres, and I'd be there for about uh, probably eight days, eight or nine days. And he always, Greg, why are you leaving? <laughs> he said, I've got a lot of grass left here. I'm like, Marshall, that's why I'm leaving. Because when I come back, there'll be more. But it was hard for him not to take that grass because he thought I was wasting it. And that's hard for, it's hard. That's a hard step to get over, folks. I'm going to warn you, it's tough. I had a guy get scared because he grew a bunch of grass. He got scared. And uh, I told him how to do it. He was feeding hay. He ran out of grass. Every, every summer he'd run out of grass. He's overstocked. And I said, go Go over here across the road. His, his brother had 40 acres. He wouldn't do anything with that. I said, put a poly wire in. Put your cows over there this spring. Don't put them on your farm until your grasses have a chance to get going. He did that. Well, then when the grasses got going, he brought his cows back, and he started grazing, and I lost track of him. He called me up in July. He goes, Greg, he said, um, I had a problem. I'm like, what? He goes, I just had too much grass. He said, I went and got my mower and I, I bailed it all. He bailed the whole farm. He mowed it all off and bailed it. And I'm like, sir, I said, you made a really, really, really bad mistake there. Oh, he said, I've got plenty of grass. He said, my God, it's just going to waste. Bailed it. So he called me back in September. This was in, this was in July. In September, he called me back and he's real quiet. He goes, Greg, it hasn't rained. He said, I'm out of grass. What should I do? I said, feed the hay. He had it. He had it. He boogered it up. He had it. He had that forage. He had his whole farm restored. All he had to do was keep grazing. But he got scared. Don't do that. You will get scared. You grow a lot of grass, it's scary. Carbon-rich soil. Dig your soil up. Learn to keep a spade on the side of your ATV or in your pickup truck or on your bicycle. Whatever mode you have, keep something with you. Dig in your soil. Look at it. It should be crumbly. You know, when you, when you look at that soil, there's little particulates in there. I mean, we get a rain. We don't get much runoff anymore. It's got to be a heavy rain. I'll show you a picture. I think I've got one here. We had like eight inches 
It wasn't eight, it was four inches, but it came quick within like three hours, just hammered us. And I'll show you what happened. But look at that. I mean, that's good, healthy soil. And the plants, good, healthy plants. We try and keep it simple. Um, we would like to run one herd as much of the year as possible. I do consulting all over the United States, and I go into people's farm, and the first thing I see is multiple herds. I'm like, oh my God. I mean, there'll be a herd over there, there'll be one over there, there'll be one over there, there'll be one over there. And I'm like, what are you doing? Well, that's my black herd. And we can't run the red herd with the black herd. And this group of heifers has got to be bred by that bull. So we've got those segregated over there. And so they're moving around their farm seven herds at one time. Folks, that's a death sentence to your grass. You're just not going to have enough time for those plants to recover. So the first thing you do in a drought, if you get in in a drought, the strongest tool you have in your grazer's toolbox, well, first is to cut the, cut the bottom 15% off your herd. You should have those numbers written down. Which cows need to go to town? And don't name your cows. <laughs> I'm serious, it'll kill you. I was on a farm in Virginia. This, this, this cow needed to go to town. She was a fly trap. All of her ribs are showing. I said, what are you doing with that one? Well, that, that, that's Molly. I'm like, Molly? Yeah, that's Molly. That's my daughter's cow. I'm like, Molly needs to go to town. Because she had flies all over her. And those flies, were in, they were attacking the good cattle. So get rid of that bottom 15%. Just sell them. Get rid of them. But the next tool you should use is combine your herds. When you have three herds, or let's say two herds, you combine them into one, you automatically double your recovery period. The people say, but Greg, you've got them all in that herd. Now they're going to graze more. Yeah, but you can tighten them down. And yes, they may overgraze that area you put them on, but you're trying to build time. You're trying to build time out in front of your cows. So in that time period, you may catch a rain. And if you do, you're going to grow grass. If you're grazing around like this, Seven herds, it doesn't matter if you get any rain, you're not going to grow anything. You're just not going to grow anything. The biggest profit robber is hay. We do live in an area where we can do winter stockpile grazing. Uh, man, I was watching the bale grazing yesterday. That just makes sense to me. I mean, you're getting all those nutrients out on your land. It cuts down on your starting a tractor up, your labor and those animals have shelters out there with that hay, the, the hay laying around them. It just looks like a really good deal to me. That's what I'd be doing if I lived up here. And they're healthier. Our animals, we don't have any buildings. Now, we don't get minus 40. Or This guy was talking to the meteorologist. The meteorologist, you all set some records this year. We don't get that in Missouri, but we can get cold for a while. Uh, I don't park cattle up on top of a ridge. You know, if it's going to be 20 below wind chill that night, I'll try and find a draw, maybe some brush where they can break that wind. I'm not going to park them up on top of a hill. And I, I think that's one of the things that has made our success is we remain flexible. We always meet in the morning and we'll draw out a plan. I do have a full-time farm manager now and I, we keep an internship, one. And we'll sit down and discuss the day and we always draw up a plan, but it's always... It, it may be changed. It may be changed when we hit the herd. Because when we get hit the herd, maybe we're getting rain or, or it's getting colder or whatever. You've got to be flexible. Don't go by a calendar. If you're moving your herd around your farm on a calendar, it's going to bite you sooner or later. Learn to look at the forage. What did it look like when you took them out? What's it look like when you put them in? And learn to monitor animal performance. I hope I have some pictures in here. I think I do of good and how you can do that. Questions to ask, where's the money going if I don't do this? Folks, I used to throw money at stuff just to try and fix it. And usually after I spent that money, I still had that problem. I used to put out a lot of seed because I was excited about, oh, this new seed's going to just whip the pants off of what I got out here and I'm going to get rich. <laughs> it's going to be so much more productive. My cattle will get fat. We're going to have more calves, whatever. Healthier, tastier, grass-fed beef. I think it's a big, big red flag when you've got to change the forage on your farm because, folks, it will come back. I've seen it. I've seen it all over the United States. A guy in Georgia put in 500 acres of Max-Q. He sprayed, he sprayed it with Roundup. His 
Kentucky 31. And the next spring, what came back, he got a stand all right, but the next spring, the army worms came in and just decimated the whole 500 acres, ate it into the dirt. Monocultures don't have single species in your plant, in your pastures. The more species, the better. So before you spend money, ask who's going to make the money. Who's making it? It may not be you. This is another video. I wish we could play it, but you can see the green. That picture was taken a couple weeks ago, but look how green that fescue stays. Oh, and this is a fescue everybody's trying to kill, okay? That stuff stays green all winter long, and the cattle do quite well on it. Budgets. I don't spend money on anything unless it eats grass. When I first started out, folks, I didn't have any money, so I couldn't spend any. And I think if you have a lot of money, that might be a curse. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen people with a lot of money get in the cattle business and they really struggle because they think they can spend their way to success. It doesn't work that way. The way you have success in grazing is to be monitoring what's happening on the land. What is the soil? What are the plants? What are the animals telling you? And money can't do that. Farm sanity items. How many tractors have calves? That's a good one. Metal destroys wealth. It's got to eat grass, and we just feel like we're investing in our own future. We changed our paradigms years ago. We're 80% lease, 20% own, and we're starting to add more of these lease farms back to us. We're actually buying them now because the animals can do that. We sold all of our equipment. We do have one tractor, and we use that in the wintertime to plow snow, but, you know, we just, we're focusing on building soil with ruminants, and I think if more people would do that, they would get along a lot better. And I'd say, you know, what's cheaper than free? So you can use solar energy to grow the plant and grow a fat animal like that. Look how fat he is. That animal has a hard time walking. You know, when you get one finished, you should have a waddle in his ass when he walks. Okay? Get behind him. If they waddle when they walk, that animal's ready to eat. And he's going to be a good eating experience. And for you all just starting out and you're only butchering a few, and I talked to a young guy last night. He was concerned about switching over to grass-fed. He said, I just don't know if it's going to be any good or not. Well, when it's butchered, you go to the arbiter or the butcher, and we always go in about the seventh day after it's hung, and we cut a ribeye out of it. Just take a ribeye out, bring it home and grill it. Make sure it's medium rare. Don't overcook it. And if your teeth glide through that ribeye, first bite, they glide through it, and you don't have to chew it for five minutes to swallow it, <laughs> that's a good eating experience. He's going to be good. If it's tough, grind it. I think grass-fed hamburger, we can't keep it in our... We just can't keep it. I mean, it just goes as fast as we butcher. So grass-fed hamburger might be something you want to focus on until you get a hold of your genetics. Maybe your forages get better. And then you can start selling steak. Another tool that you can use, I'll show you real quick. Take your steak, lay it on the tabletop, Use your finger and set it on top of the steak. And just let the weight of your, and close your eyes, and let the weight of your hand go down through that steak. If it feels like a tarpaulin, <laughs> there's some resistance there, that's probably going to be a tough eater. But if your finger glides through that meat and you can feel the countertop, boy, that's going to be a good one. You can go ahead and grill it, but it's going to be good. So that's what we do. We like to think ourselves as regenerative, minimal inputs. We grow things without cultivation. Don't open up the soil. Pat Richardson did a study in Texas where she took a very diverse pasture. She measured the soil life in it beforehand. Then she had a farmer go through it with a disc. And the disc was not set aggressively. It was just straight. So all it did was cut holes in it. I think it went down three inches. One pass. She went out there and she took, she resampled that pasture. It killed 80% of the soil life. One pass. Yeah, so we need to keep this soil covered up. Don't be cultivating it. You should see improvement each year. If you don't see things getting better each year, you need to step back and look at what you're doing. Okay, because we are in the solar energy collection business. That's what we do. And so one of the things that we do in the springtime, we like to give them a head start. I don't want to go out there. We were taught early on in some of the grazing schools that you had grass as tall as your fingers. You needed to be out there on it. Okay, you needed to have those cows out there immediately. Otherwise, the grass would get away from you. 
Well, we found out and we got out, we got the animals out there early. We were lopping off the baby's head. So we took immature spring plants that had low energy, high protein, and our animal performance just sucked. It was terrible. The tails on them would be runny, runny manure going down them. Here's where we're at today. Look at that. So that's early spring. We always keep some winter stockpile. So that was grass that was grown the previous year. I'm sorry, the previous fall. That dead stuff. See the brown in there? You can just see a brown haze through there. Okay. This paddock was never grazed in the wintertime. So in the spring, when the spring grass came up, it's almost at boot stage. Well, what is boot stage? Boot stage is right when the seed head is starting to emerge. We nailed it. We came in there and took the top third of that. And the cows, when they grazed it, they got a little bit of that dry matter with every bite full of grass. It perfectly balanced their rumen. Perfectly. It used to be dangerous to stand behind one of our cows in the springtime. Because, I mean, there'd be squirts going five feet out. Just too much protein. There wasn't anything there to slow up that spring grass. We feel like grass is probably the mo one of the most powerful tools we have at our disposal. We can build healthy soil. It's a free solar panel. It controls erosion. And we have an animal that we can sell at the end of that. And s folks, we need to keep the water on our land. You realize now they just came up with a bill. I believe it was New Jersey. They're going to start taxing you for your water. The water that runs off your land, they're going to tax you for it. Because that water is going into the sewer system. They don't like that. <laughs> so if you have a lot of concrete on your land, the water leaves, they're going to tax you for rainwater. Just another tax they, they dreamed up, but it may come. I hope not, but we need to keep the water on our land, you know. That's what this cover crop and soil health things we're talking about doing. I like to invest money into animal eats grass. Gives you a baby every year while building soil. How much forage do you leave? Folks, when you move those cattle out of that paddock, there should be enough grass in there for one more day without overgrazing the remaining plants. And you got to develop a grazer's eye. So if you go out there and you give them a strip the size of this room and they've taken over half of it, you probably need to give them a bigger area the next morning. Don't get blindsided and keep doing it the same way every day. So we're just taking the top third of the plant. That's what we're doing now. And what we found out, folks, and we switched our grazing to more up taller in the plant, our animal performance just skyrocketed. We haven't had pink eye now for three years. Heck, we used to get 15, 20 cases of it every summer. We'd have a calf that'd start watering, and if we were lucky, it just, it would get over it in about three weeks, you'd have a spot in the eye. The really bad ones, they'd been turned white. They'd lose the eye. We don't get that anymore. Why? We still have the same cattle, same farm. We're grazing differently. We're grazing for energy. Our animals are getting fatter, quicker. The frame size. Most of our cattle, we started out with the big ones. We were at 1,400 pounds for a cow. 13, 14, now our cows are somewhere between 900 to 1,000 pounds. And we found out that these cows can winter. They can winter and, and keep their condition on quite well. And they don't have that newspaper underneath them. They got short, fine bones. Learn to look at the bones on your cattle. If you've got great big bones, a lot of thick bone, I'm talking big bones on your cattle. That's a high-maintenance animal. That animal's going to eat a lot of hay. She's going to require a lot of nutrients to just to keep her maintenance going, okay? You can't eat bone. This animal's got very fine bone structure. How often do you move them? We talked a little bit about that already. The grazing rule is fast growth. You go fast moves. Slow growth, slow them up. Observe your livestock grazing behavior. When you move those animals, there shouldn't be a death triangle. I hope to goodness I've got a picture of it up here. I'll show you all what that looks like. Watch your livestock drink. If livestock go into your water source and they're licking at your water and they're, they're walking around that tank licking at it, they're not putting their head down taking deep gulps. But those animals are telling you, you've got bacteria in your water. They're trying to find a place in that tank that doesn't stink. There's my neighbor on the right. That's us on the left. And she's got 100 acres there. There's, I don't know, probably 20 head of livestock on that. We've got 300 on the left side. But they're only there for about eight days. There's 45 acres in that farm. We just move them around. And she's convinced that we get more rain than she does. She is. I can't convince her. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to set a rain gauge right there. So we can, we can compare the rain. Um, I like that picture. 
A lot of armor on the ground. Folks, this next one is my picture. I'm not proud of it, but I'm going to show you anyway. Look at that. That was my first year of mob grazing. And Ian was very diplomatic that fall. He came, <laughs> he saw what I was doing. He's like, Greg, you might just try giving him just a touch more litter on the ground. <laughs> He didn't tell me I was stupid or ignorant. He just said, you might give him a touch more litter. So he's pretty diplomatic. Now he just tells me I'm stupid. We've gotten to be really good friends. But folks, look at that. Burn this into your mind. You don't want cows to reach under the wire. If they're reaching under that wire, taking a risk of shocking their neck because they've gotten that darn hungry, or they might even be down on their knees reaching under there, you didn't give them a big enough area. You should have moved them sooner or give them a larger area. So burn that in. Do you see any of this? Absolutely not. The cows ate it all. Um, that's not a very good picture of limiting them, but right there is that hip bone. And right in front of that hip bone is a depression there. I've got better pictures, I hope, but there's a depression right in front of the hip bone on the left side of the animal. It's not on the right. It's on the left side. If that depression is sunken in, you've limited your cow herd. And if you continue to do that, they're not going to breed. Or not very many of them will. So if you have a low breed back, you need to look in the mirror. It's probably your fault you didn't feed the animals correctly. So I changed my mindset a little bit, our methods. 2006, we were doing, we were doing management intensive grazing on a, just a two-day rotation. Two days, two days, two days, two days. Every two days we moved them. And in 2006, I heard Ian speak and we started doing more of the high-density mob grazing and this is some of the results we've seen we're starting to see a, a grass volume pick up higher quality more diversity and lastly it allowed me to quit my job in town that was my goal and at age 50 i was able to walk away from my town job and it's been i haven't looked back since but if i hadn't switched the way i grazed i'd still be working in town because folks we were able to double our numbers now it took me several years to do that you can't go home from this conference and double your numbers it's not going to happen but when you start doing some of this you will start to grow more forage and gradually bump up your stocking rate don't go out and buy twice as many cows it'll be a wreck these are the results we're seeing we don't put down lime or fertilizer, no seeding. We went from four acres to two acres per animal unit. You know what worked for a thousand years? Basically, that's all we're doing. We're duplicating nature. One species supports eight. Diversity is king on our farm. We embrace that. We feel like bare soil is death to plants. And it looks like this. If you get a bare spot in Missouri, it will crack open. It just cracks open. Folks, when your farm looks like that, you are done. You better either feed hay or sell your livestock. Because if you leave them out on land like that and you keep grazing, it may take you two to three years for that farm to recover. Because you took off everything. Don't, don't get to that spot. <laughs> I, t I snuck across the fence on my neighbors. I knew he wasn't there. He might have not have been happy, but I was out there taking pictures. And this is another picture. That's that farm we got the four inches. My neighbor that doesn't like his topsoil, look at the color. This is my neighbor over here. This is coming off our property. That was that four inch rain. Look at the color of the water. A little bit of a difference there. Examine your soil. What's down there? Okay, look down in your soil. Stop burning. I hate that. I just hate burn. I see people burn. The Amish community, I love the Amish. We've got a big community of not far from us. And they're, you know, health stewards of the land. They're all burning. They're even burning their corn stubble. I'm like, what are you doing burning your corn stubble? But they've got this idea that if they burn it, it'll be better. It'll be nice and bright green in the spring. It's not going to end good. It's not going to end well. Spider webs, signs of life. This is our steps. We've got to get taller plants. You can't grow an armor on your soil. If you're grazing it when it's that tall, you're never going to get any plants tall enough to trample on the ground. Starting to do some of this. This is some of our civil pasture work. So we go in and trim out some of these trees. This is an area of just second growth trees. There wasn't much good trees in there. And we do a TSI, which is a timber stand improvement. And we come in behind that and we get lumber. We saw some lumber off of some of the logs we take out. Then the shiitake. We're getting into shiitake, and then, of course, you get firewood, but then the savanna. So we're getting this beautiful civil pasture at the end, and it, this is the process. We bring the cattle in, unroll the carbon in the wintertime. That's followed up with pigs coming through there. That's some of the lumber. 
We've got our own sawmill now. Uh, we're sawing lumber. We're starting to build some things with that. This is the shiitakes. Um, I just played with this a little bit, folks. We had all these trees. I'm like, what am I going to do? I can't cut all up into firewood. And so I started growing food on logs. And today, I started out with 40 logs. Today, we've got 2,000. Look at that. You can grow food on wood. I see trees out here. You got to keep them in the shade. You got to watch the hydration of them. You can't let them get too dry. But you know, we're getting $10 a pound and they'll fruit four times the summer. That's $40 per log. Okay, there's a harvest. That night, we cut 180 pounds. That's $1,800 in one harvest. That's some of the furniture we're building. We went with the live the live edge. We, people really like the live edge. Folks, we used to burn those. That's the cedar. <laughs> That's eastern red cedar. I used to burn them or make a post out of them. Now we're selling picnic tables. Got the trees out there. Uh, that's one of our soil life workshops we held with Elaine Ingham. I love this quote. There's nothing in nature is given. It is one. That's what's being taught to our students today, a lot of them. That's engraved in ag building. I'm not going to tell you where it's at. It's in one of the states. But what we're teaching kids, it's, it's kind of a travesty, in, is unless you get a bigger chemical or a meaner one or a bigger piece of equipment and beat Mother Nature into submission, she wins. No. We need to learn to work with her. And we can heal our farms, we can heal our soils and our communities. This is in Africa by Ian's place, a bunch of goats. And in Africa, they, he calls that harvesting energy. That's a kudu. Ian can sell kudu off of his farm to his neighbors. The meat, of course, to shoot that thing is $12,000. So you, we're looking at some of that, the recreational. We do have our own Airbnb now. And uh, folks, we got to get people out on the land. The people here in Bismarck, they don't know what's going out on your farm. Get a website going. Get an email list. Let people know where you're at. Give them your story. Three cow marketing. How many of y'all have heard of that? Three cow marketing. Write it down. Three cow marketing. It's done by Charlotte Smith. She's the best in the United States. She will teach you how to do that email list. You've got to get your name out there in front of people. They will buy your story. They're not going to buy your product. They're buying your story who you are, what you're doing. That's the customer you want. Charlotte Smith, Three Cow Marketing. That's our grazing school that we hold every year at our farm. Ian and I will be holding it this year. And that's our website. There's a lot of stuff on that website as far as videos. And I also have a YouTube channel I'm posting. I've been kind of crazy with it lately. I'm putting one on about every day. Just covering some of the things I think that are instrumental on remaining profitable, building good soil, getting the right kind of livestock, and having a high quality of life. Folks, Ian said back in, this, in the early 1900s in Africa, the banks wanted the farmers on their board. They wanted the successful farmers on their board. Because if they were smart enough to run a farm, by God, they wanted them on their board of directors. And today, you're, not, you're a farmer? Because you weren't smart enough to be anything else. That's, the, that's kind of the thing that's being taught. And it's just the opposite. We're at the top of the food chain. Without farmers, everybody starves. So kudos to all y'all for being great farmers. And thank you all. Questions for Greg? There's one right here. <clears throat> Hold on. Yeah. Thank you um, for this presentation. It was great. Um, when you say you keep your herds, your herds together, do you keep your finishing animal with your cows that have calves? And do you move them all together, or how does that work? The, the question is, when we move the cows together, do we keep the cows and calves and the heifers and the bulls all together? You've got you've to watch the bulls when you have them into the cows if you don't want to be winter calving. So, you know, you get the bulls out of there, but we can run the bulls pretty late. One of the things that we, we don't do is we don't wean. We haven't weaned now for 13 years. Um, we let the cow wean the calf, and what we found out, now, this is not 100%, so don't take this to the bank, <laughs> but our heifers are not breeding early. And that's because we'll get an occasional heifer that'll breed early, but not very many of them. And that's because we don't treat them like heifers. In other words, they're not taken out at seven months. We don't feed them a ration to make them put on a lot of weight, and so they're not cycling. And we've also found if you don't break the mother-daughter relationship of the heifer with the cow, in other words, take her out and wean her, then throw her back in the herd, she's more apt to take a bull. 
Um, that's what we've been doing. Um, it's working fairly well. But boy, here a minute, up here, folks, you've got to control your bowls. You don't want to be winter calving. I guess you, there are people that are winter calving. You've got calving barns, and that works for you, that's fine. But uh, it's a lot easier to, to calve in Mother Nature, and you have a lot higher quality of life. Yes, ma'am. Talk up, I can't hear you. Your, your finishers. Um, oh, the finishers. Can, the finishers is more what I was curious I'm sorry, about. I didn't understand the question. Yeah, on the, on the grass finished bees. they go with the cows? They're, they're run right with the mob. When you're finishing bees in the mob, you don't watch the cows, you don't watch the calves, you don't watch the bulls, you watch those bees. Make sure they're getting all they want to eat. You can finish your bees in a mob. You don't need a set. I was doing that. Ian came to, came to my farm he said, what are you doing something stupid like that for? I had a leader follower herd. My, my, fo my leaders were the, the finishers, and then I had my cow-calf herd behind them. I'm like, well, Ian, they're getting the best. They're getting fat. He says, so what you're telling me in Africa, on the Serengeti, and you got a million wildebeest going across the prairie, the, little, the young ones go, oh, we got to leave and get fat. No, they get eaten by a lion. You can still get them fat in your herd. You don't need two herds. You don't. You absolutely don't. But you've got to focus on those. Make sure they get enough to eat. Don't be doing high density where they t you know, you're putting them in real tight and everything's fighting for something to eat. You've got to loosen them up a little bit. But you can finish them in the mob. Yes, there's... Yeah, you talked a bit about pigs in the woods and keeping them from nuking it. What were you using for a cover crop? Or what shade-friendly seeding were you doing? What were we using for a cover crop on the pigs in the woods behind them? It was a nine-way species. I was getting it from uh, Walnut Creek in Ohio, Dave Brandt, his son. And uh, it was just a nine-way species. It was all warm season. A warm season, yeah. But the pigs do an awesome job of working that up. Folks, you got to keep them moving, though. you got to break your pigs to hot wire, and you do that in a crowd. When they're little guys, they're feeder pigs. A pig's easy to break the hot water because they don't have any skin. I'm sorry, any hair. When they get shot, oh, God, they hate it. Yeah. On these animals that, you've, that you're finishing to, uh, to go to market, uh, how do you control... Uh, any deleterious effect from, uh, say, a noxious weed or something like that. I know in New Zealand, when they're finishing, they will go on to a monoculture that they're very, they know it's a, it's a, it's a good pasture, and they allow that 30 days to, uh, for so, the So the question you're asking me is, in the finishing period, how do, we get, how do we keep from having off flavors in our finished product by on a diverse pasture? Well, folks, there's some weeds out there. there. It's not a constant supply of them. I think diversity is good. It makes your pasture stronger. And I sure don't want a monoculture anywhere on my farm. If I've got a pasture that I've got to put them on to finish them and it's a monoculture, I'll be out of business. Because there's going to be a flea beetle. Something's going to come in and attack that. I don't want that. I think in nature, I mean, deer, they get fat. They're not on a monoculture of soybeans or corn. They're constantly moving. And that's the key. We move our animals twice a day, all year long. Even today, while I'm here, those cows are moving this morning. They'll be moved tonight. That's what happened in nature. You don't see, you know, you didn't have a million, a million buffalo staying in one area. They'd run out of feed. And they defecate it so bad they all have parasites. They moved. Keep them moving. Animals like to be moved. And it's good for them. And it's good for you and the land. Question in the There's back a question there, there in the back. Yeah. That was a good question. Uh, when you uh, grew the shiitake mushrooms on your timber that you harvested, did you uh, introduce... Uh, mushroom spores to get them to grow, or how did you? The question was, how did we inoculate our mushroom logs? Folks, the mushroom logs all come out of the tops, the tops of the tree, your sapwood, stuff that's only suitable for firewood. You don't grow mushrooms on the logs, not the log portion or the trunk. 
The mushrooms live in the, in the sap area, the sap wood, okay? You drill a hole in it, you put your spawn in, and you seal it. We use Field and Forest out of Wisconsin. It's the best that I've found in the United States. They have all the tools. It, all you got to have is a little router bit that goes in a drill, and it's got a stop on it. You drill a hole in it, you put your spawn in there, and you seal it. Take your wife's electric skillet, Okay, put your a thing of wax in there to, me, to melt your wax and then never give her back her skillet. That's, a, that's your skillet for your mushroom logs. Folks, once you inoculate them, they're good, for, they're good for five to seven years. You never have to re-inoculate them again, ever. But you got to take seven months, seven to nine months for that mycelium to colonize that log. In other words, it goes all through that sap and they set up shop in there, Okay. And then they just explode out of those holes you drilled. I will give you a tip. If you're going to do this, cover your logs with a breathable dark cloth. Mushroom logs can't take sunlight. Well, they can take a little bit, but not full sunlight. So you put a, a, some kind of cloth over them to kind of shade the sun, but also to protect them from the woodpeckers. Woodpeckers like to pick that spawn out. Once that spawn colonizes that log, you're good to go after that. You don't have to worry about woodpeckers. Yes? With all these different products, how do you integrate your marketing? With all these different products, how do we integrate our marketing website? Have you been to our website? You need to go to it. Across the top, folks, there's like seven or eight columns, and under each column, you click on it, that's what's available. It's just... It's a really good format. I just started it in January. We had an old website. It wasn't worth a darn. It was hard to use. This one's awesome. I would highly recommend looking at that as a model for you all to see. If you don't have a website, look at that one. You don't have to copy it, but it's a good format for posting stuff in there. It's all local. It's all local. We don't, well, the only thing we ship is books. You know, we have my, my books, but everything else... Uh, we're selling that bailing roller now. I'm, I've got a guy manufacturing, that I call it the Greg Judy original bailing roller. There's people driving all over the United States to get those bailing rollers. They didn't know about it until I put a video out. Go to, folks, you can go to YouTube and get your own channel and start spreading the rumor of what you're doing on your farm. Once it goes into a YouTube format, you can grab that video and embed it in your website. It's easy. It's so easy to do. I'm not a high-tech person, but I got onto it pretty quick. I'm serious. You got to you got to put your shingle out there. You got to let people know what you're doing, because they're not going to find you. You have a great story. You're raising, you're raising great animals, healthy food, healthy soil. People don't care, but they care about you. They, they'll care about your story. You're building a relationship. But it all starts with that email marketing list. Yes. The question is, do we supply mineral with our cattle? Absolutely. We're doing free choice minerals. I didn't have a picture on it, but it's got 16 holes in it. We call it our traveling laboratory. The animals get to pick what's missing from that mineral box. Cattle poop out 80% of the mineral back onto the land. Over time, by moving around your farm like that, the animals will remineralize your farm what's missing. That's what we've been doing for 11 years. Our mineral usage is down 65% in 11 years. Ian is down about 85%, but he's been on it for 20 years. Animals know what they need. They know what they need. If they can select, they will pick it out. We're using Free Choice Enterprises out of Wisconsin. Yeah. One more question. Yes, in the back. In your transition away from Ivalmec, how did you deal with lice? How did we deal with lice in our transition away from Ivamec? Uh, we still get some lice, but if we get one that's really bad, we'll call her and just get rid of that animal. Why aren't all of them bare skinned? Some of them have pretty darn good resistance. The ones that really get ate up, get rid of them. Problem solved. We all want a recipe. We all want something that we can just fix it. We can just fix it. Sometimes it's calling. Folks, we are the predator. I'm going to leave with this quote. We are the predator in our herd. You'll never have a herd any better than what you call for. Get rid of them. Quit making excuses for them. They don't care. 
Those cows don't care if you make a living. They really don't. It's up to you. You've got to get those animals off your farm. Thank you all.